Good morning, class. We are, well, it might not be morning where you're watching this, but anyway, wherever, whatever time of the day it is, good, whatever, okay. Um, we are in class number five. This is the final class of Redemption in the Old Testament. We are coming to an end. We're at the end. So today's video will be short. Today's class will be a little bit shorter than the normal because um, I want to give you a chance to get into the test, the final, okay? So thank you for um, taking the journey with us here at the WBSU school. And um, hopefully you're gaining, learning, developing into a little better understanding and relationship of who you are and who the Father is and all that good stuff. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Now, we've, we've taken a different approach to perhaps the, what the title says or maybe what you thought the title, what you would get out of the title or what you would get based upon the title. We're taking a different approach. We, um, the Old Testament is a book that has many shadows and types, meaning there's many... There are many shadows. There's many um, things in the new in the Old Testament that indicate to us things that are coming. So that's what a shadow is. It's it's this is here. It's it's you know it, it has a meaning for that. It had a meaning for them there, but for us, it's a shadow. It's something to that is saying it's coming. And in the New Testament, in the, in the um, in the um, Old Testament, there is no, there is no, no, uh, oh, my screen keeps getting changed. There is no, um, there is no, oh, excuse me, class, we lost words. There is no cross. Okay, thank you. There's no cross in the Old Testament. So there's nothing to point to to say, okay. This is this is that. However, what we do have, we have a bunch of these shadows, right? So I decided to take a look at a group of people that started, kind of started the whole thing with Abraham, right? So had this 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 man named Abraham who who believed he heard God say to leave what he was around, what he knew. Abraham amongst other things was an idol worshiper. He worshiped many gods. I said this a couple of classes ago and not to start chaos or controversy, but we have no real evidence that Abraham ever stopped worshiping the other gods. We don't. We know that he was. History, history tells us that. You got to look outside the Bible to find that, that information, but he was. But my point is, Abraham brought in to his relationship with father a lot of the the idolistic cultural things that he understood and he was used to we see his story begin in chapter 12 of genesis and then by chapter 13 abraham is sacrificing he built an altar i mean what do people do at altars okay back then if you built an altar you were sacrificing something on that altar he did a unprovoked sacrifice. Now, where did he get this idea? Where did he get this concept? He got it from his own experiences so far. Every God he, he worshiped, he interacted with, he believed those gods needed a sacrifice. So that's where that came in. And so Abraham, considered the father of that nation, he sacrificed and taught Isaac how to sacrifice and Jacob how to sacrifice and they sacrificed all along the way. So we were taking a look at that group of people and taking them from where, where the father intended. The father came to Abraham and said, I want to show you that I'm your father, not your God, but your father. You're your father and I want to show you that I'm father. Abraham didn't catch that. He called God. He caught the God aspect of it. He didn't catch the father aspect of it. So we have this story going down through all of these years of this group of people who, who believe they know God, but they don't know father. And that goes on until Jesus comes and begins to reveal father. Okay. So we, 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 we started with Abraham. We're going to end with 
Joshua. So in today's class, we're going to take a real quick Moses to Joshua transition. Now, Moses' story picks up in Exodus, and it goes all the way through the Deuteronomy, and there's no way in the world we're going to cover all these stories. We're going to give a nutshell version of Moses. I think we focus a lot on Moses and not too much on Joshua. And Joshua is a shadow, again, a shadow and type of Christ, a deliverer, a savior, so to speak. He brings the people out of the wilderness into the promised land. So we spent, we went from uh, Abraham to the promise, Isaac, and well, Abraham to Joseph, we, we did that over a, a good portion of time, uh, you know, maybe three or four, three, maybe three, yeah, three classes. Then we went from Joseph to Moses in our last class, well, last class and a half particularly. And now we're going to do particularly or specifically Moses to Joshua. Okay, so that's where we are today. All right. So in Exodus chapter one, we remember the story, right? In Genesis chapter 15, God tells Abraham, um, your, your descendants, your seed, they're going to be in a place one day. And eventually, in that place, they're going to be in bondage, okay? Now, it says 400 years, but we explained in the previous class that that 400 years is not from 400 years of bondage, like most people read it, but it's not. He said they're going to be a stranger in the land for 400 years, and they're going to be oppressed, the 400 years starts when Joseph gets there. So that, that's when that 400-year period starts in Egypt, that the place God was referring to. And Joseph is there. He becomes second in command. He brings his family there. 120 people from the line of Abraham. And he brings those people there. And they grow and grow and years 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 pass by. And to the point where the people that started with 120 were really one. And then, you know, overnight, by the time Jacob and his, his the rest of Joseph's family got there, overnight they went from one. Well, Joseph had his, his, his sons at this point, but um, it went from one to... <clears throat> to uh, 120, I mean, like, just like that. And then over the years, they grew immensely. One day, a pharaoh who rose to power didn't know Joseph. Remember, this is years, have hundreds of years now probably have passed since Joseph died and Joseph was second in command. It's much like you today, if you live in the States, you don't know George Washington until someone tells you about George Washington. So if you're a, you're a young kid right now and someone were to say, who's the president? You would probably, say, you know, if you're conscious enough to be aware, you, you would say Donald Trump. If they would say, who's George Washington? And you, you haven't really been in school yet, right? So let me say it this way. If, you, if you're maybe three or four, you know, maybe getting ready to go to kindergarten this year, and you live in a house where they talk politics a lot and you keep hearing this name Donald Trump and Donald Trump and you hear the word president and president. So over time, you'll, you know, you'll pick up that Donald Trump is the president. You, you're pretty consciously aware of what this is talking about. You don't know a whole lot at five, but you know, you know, you can catch it. And if someone walked up to you and said, who's George Washington? You'd say, I don't know. Who's Abraham Lincoln? I don't know. Who's Thomas Jefferson? I don't know, <laughs> right? You, you wouldn't know. They wouldn't know because they haven't been told who this is yet. They haven't read the history books yet. So in the same context with Joseph, a new pharaoh rises up. He doesn't know Joseph. This has been a long time since that period with Joseph ended. And all he knows is that there's these non-Egyptian people and they're all over the place. They're 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 they're, they're growing. They, well, they've they've ha they've grown, and they're almost outnumbering the Egyptians that live in that land. Or they're definitely growing to a, an alarming number to this pharaoh. And this pharaoh gets afraid for his own uh, welfare and the welfare of his people. Says, 
yeah, listen, these people are growing and they're going to overtake us, so we got to do something about it. So since they were the power that be, they decided to put them in oppressive situations to enslave them. So that was really only the last portion of their time in, in Egypt. Now, we're here now at the point where they were being oppressed. They were being enslaved, forced into slavery, forced into working, for, forced into hard tasked labor. And we, we pick up that story now in the book of <clears throat> Exodus, sorry. So Exodus chapter one. Um, and these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man and his household came with Jacob. And there's the names. I'm not going to go through all the names. Okay. And those who were the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died with all of his brothers and all of, the, all of that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty in the land filled with them. And there rose a new king over Egypt that did not know Joseph. And he said to them, mm, did I get that one? Yeah. He said to them, um, I'm sorry, I had another thought in class. I'm sorry. And he said to them, um, hold on, one second, class. Let me just look back at something. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, I just realized something, class. Okay, give me a minute. Uh, how can I check it? Give me a minute, class. I just realized, I may have made an error on something. And if I did, then that means I have to fix something. Um, redemption, week three. I'm sorry, class. Just bear with me for a minute here. Because I think I may have made an error. Oh, I did. I did. I may have, I, I made an error on some of your grades. I marked um, last week's class, I said the number of people who came from Egypt, from Canaan was 120. It was 70 people, actually, that should be false. And my grade sheet, I marked it as true, I, mis, I misread that. So if I sent your test back and I marked that one wrong, then I will go back and correct those for you. So I may, I may need to, let me just take a look. I, it, just, it just hit me, class, so I apologize for that. Okay, so I only got one back so far. So Emmanuel, you got it, I marked you for 60. You're actually 80. So I changed that in my grade book. Okay. 
All right. Sorry about that. All right. So let's go back to this. Uh, give me one second, class. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Now, okay. Now, go back to Exodus chapter 1. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, verse 9. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal truly with them. They multiply, and it happened in the event of war that they join our enemies and fight against us, and we go up out of the land. So they put these taskmasters over them. They not only put taskmasters over them, but they make a plan to try to, uh, not genocide, well, it's, they do a genocidal act. Um, they try to, try to euthanize, they start this euthanize moment, euthanization moment, where they want to try to control the population. So their ideal is, we're going to kill all the kids, all the boys below the age of two. So we're trying to control population, kind of like euthanasia. So what they do is they're, they're doing now these, these vicious, vile things. A baby is born named Moses. The mother fears for the baby's life, puts the baby in the basket in the Nile, sends the baby away to float down the Nile. Okay. The baby's basket with the baby still alive gets discovered by... Uh, one of Pharaoh's daughters, she sees the baby, takes the baby, keeps the baby, nurtures the baby, raises the baby. Therefore, Moses grows up in the house of Pharaoh. Moses then one day, and he, he knew he was not Egyptian. He knew this, but he lived in the house of Pharaoh and he was, you know, considered part of the family, so to speak. He um, one day sees an Egyptian taskmaster being very harsh, and beating on a Israelites, a Israeli, or a, one of the slaves from the Israelites or whatever. Moses, in an act of rage and defiance, kills this Egyptian. I always wonder, since Moses was some call him a prince of Egypt. If he was a person of power, he lived in the palace, couldn't he have just told the guy to stop, perhaps? You know, hey, what are you doing? Don't treat them that way. Or, you know, this is not the way to get the most production out of the people, whatever. But for whatever reason, Moses kills this person. And then he realizes he killed this person, then he runs. And he finds himself in the wilderness, on the backside of the mountain, trying to shed his identity and, and hide from Pharaoh. He runs into this encounter with a burning bush. Out of this burning bush, he hears the voice of God. He gets his walking papers, his orders, so to speak, to go down, tell Pharaoh to let his people go. Now, the same Pharaoh he, he knew, the same Pharaoh who he lived in his house, I can come back to Egypt, let my people go, okay? Um, and we, we pretty much pick up the story there. We, we know, I'm not going to go to all the detail, but I want to get to Joshua before the class is over, how Joshua comes in. And so I'm going to just kind of paraphrase us through the Moses experience. Moses goes down, he gets Aaron to be his running mate, 
he goes down to Egypt. He begins this war with Pharaoh. Let my people go. Pharaoh's, who's your God? Why do I have to listen to him? And according to Moses, God sends plagues to Egypt. I'll be honest with you, class, and you don't have to dwell on this or anything. I don't believe that God calls the plagues to come to Egypt. I don't believe that. I, I don't. Um, to, to put that on God would, to, would suggest that God creates calamities. And to me, that's not love. So I don't believe God put those on them. Um, Moses grew up. I'll just leave it at that. I don't believe God did that. Um, you know, the Egyptian people, the everyday common Egyptian. Well, let me say this. The Egyptian people were God's children, too. They came from the father, just like the Israelites. They were loved unconditionally, just like everyone else on the world is and was. You get what I'm saying? They were people, too. Created by the Father in his image, in his likeness. Okay? What we've done in a huge society and within humanity, we have made all these divisions. So a very common division is black and white. You know, at one point, and it's and unfortunately still in the minds of some, not all, of course, and not many, I don't believe. I think it's just a small portion of people. They believe they're superior to other people of color, you know? And they create this superiority in their own minds and they begin to devalue the people around them. That's why slavery in this country at one point was okay and permitted by so many. Because the people that they enslaved and captured, that they captured and enslaved, they considered them to be of no real value. So that mindset was created and it just festered on for 200 years that we had slavery in this country. And in, some, in the minds of some, it is still going on today. So think about it like that. The Egyptians, at least in this aspect, saw no value in the Israelites. The Israelites saw no value in the Egyptians. So, but our father saw value in both. They both, even though they're labeled Egyptian and Israelites, they both had value with father. They both were children of the father. They both were created by the father. So that's why I don't believe the father put these things on them because what does a person who has nothing to do with the decision of Pharaoh have to do with why should they suffer? They didn't do anything. They didn't have anything to do with it. And so someone's going to say, well, see, that's because God wanted to show his power. Well, if that's true, just kill Pharaoh. Moses comes in. Pharaoh, God said, let his people go. Pharaoh says, God, who, who's, who's your God? Your God doesn't have any control over me. And Moses says, oh, no. And Pharaoh drops dead. And then the second in power goes, yeah, y'all get out of here. I see your God's power and y'all go, go, just go. We, we, yeah, yeah, he's God. It could have been that simple, right? If, that's was, if that was God. Oh, but that's how he showed his power with the template. He wanted to show the other nations how powerful he was. That sounds like the, the egotistical, maniacal, sadistic mind that would tell you that. He wanted to show how powerful he was. Let me tell you something. All power doesn't have to show anything or anyone how powerful it is. It just is, and it knows it. God's all powerful. He's always been all powerful. He's never been on some ego trip. He's never been... Is a psychopath that I'm going to show you who's boss. I'm going to show you how powerful I am. You are not going to do what I say. I'll show you how powerful I am. That's the twisted mindset of us. We, we develop that mindset. We think God is like that and he's not. So I just leave that out there. And you can, it may come back and tell you later on in life. I don't know. But anyway, so anyway, you know, 
According to the story Moses wrote, there's all these signs, there's all these plagues and 10 plagues and the last one being the killing of the firstborn, which again, I don't see it. But anyway, not here to talk about that necessarily, even though I did a little bit. So um, Pharaoh finally says, okay, enough is enough. Y'all get out of here. They get out of there. They, they start their p pilgrimage from Egypt. Pharaoh changes his mind. He goes, chases them. The Red Sea opens up. Israel walks over, the Egyptians try to cross, and they all get drowned. Another act of God, they say. Yeah, about that. Anyway, so now they're in the wilderness. They're in the wilderness. And for 40 years, they wander in the wilderness looking for this promised land. And this story is laced with them and Moses in this wilderness them, the children of Israel, being disobedient and ungrateful and just full of this and full of that. And Moses, according to how he wrote it, gets laws from God and law after law after law. And before this 40 years is over, they've got a ton of laws they're supposed to obey. And if they don't obey it, as you see in Deuteronomy chapter 28, if they don't obey it, ooh, God's going to get them something fierce. And then we get to the point where Moses is about to die, which leads us up to where we're going. Moses is about to die, and according to Moses, Moses says, God said, I can't go in the promised land. I've seen it. I've seen it, but I can't go with you. I've been a good, faithful servant of the Lord for 40 plus years. I've I was so faithful to God for 40 plus years. I served him well for 40 plus years. But because I made one little small mistake when he told me to speak to the rock, I hit the rock. Because I made this one small mistake, I, he won't let me go in the promised land. He won't let me. I made this bad little small mistake. So I can't go with you but Joshua will take you. I've seen it though, it's really beautiful. And oh, how I wish I can go with you, but I can't because God won't let me because I made one mistake. I'm being sarcastic, of course, and I hope you catch that. It's intentional, yes, it is. But anyway, that's the story as it's written. And so we find ourselves at the point where now the children of Israel are about to go over into the land. Now, I brought you here, class, and, and again, today's class is going to be very short because I want you to be able to spend enough time that you need to focus on the exam before the next round begins. So I just gave you a quick overview of pretty much all of uh, <clears throat> all of the five books of Moses, well, actually starting in Exodus, so the last four books. And that's pretty much the story as most people understand it and, you know, whatever. So now I want to introduce Joshua to the story. We're going to spend the next part of the class, um, which is the last part of this whole five-week class, on Joshua, the savior, the deliverer of the people. He brings them out of the wilderness, finally into a promised land, okay? And we're going to, we're going to look at chapter one. Okay, we're going to look at chapter 1, and in the first nine verses, very, well, primarily. Well, not done. Okay, the book of Joshua chapter one. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that, Mo that the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, let me, I'm sorry, let me, before I read that, let me bring Joshua into the story a little sooner. Joshua, as, it, as we understand from the small little bit that we have of him in scripture, he becomes the kind of right hand of Moses. There's a moment where Moses gets 12 spies. They're called together and says, go out and 
search the land, go out and view the land. This land that God promised us, go out and look at it, come back and tell us what you see. The 12 spies go in, the 12 spies come back and they say, oh, the land is great. Oh, the land is plentiful. Oh, the land, the land, the land is oh, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's all that we were promised. It's all that God told us. But, 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 oh, there are giants in the land. There are, oh, there are strong armies in the land. There's, oh, there's a lot of stuff. And I, don't, I just don't think we, little small people that we are, we're, we're capable of overcoming them. And it says that Joshua and Caleb spoke up and said, don't listen to that. Yes, the land is indeed good. Yes, the land is indeed plentiful. But, but, but. If God said this land is ours, then my God, let's use our faith and let's believe God. And that's what we get a picture of Joshua. And according to Moses, you know, the people listened to the 10 and they cried all night long. They just cried all night long. They were just so, oh, we won't make it all. We can't do it. They cried all night long. And then God is looking down at their tears and their dismay and their sadness and says, I'm so sick of these people. They won't believe me. They're all going to die. And only Joshua and Caleb is going to go into the promised land and a whole group of new people. And we know how that story goes, right? Anyway, so we end up here now with Joshua at that point where 40 years have gone by. A whole generation of people have died, including Moses, and they're here now with a whole group of new people. And this is what Joshua hears. He said, Joshua, my servant is dead. Or, I'm sorry, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, now go over this Jordan <coughs> and all the people to the land I'm giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place where the sole of your foot tread upon, I give it to you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness to this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will not leave you, nor will I forsake you. Be strong, be of courage, uh, for to this people you shall divide an inheritance, which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe according to, the, according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. It shall, you shall meditate in the day and night. And that you will observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. I have not commanded you. Be strong and of good courage and be not afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua is a shadow and a type of a deliverer. Okay? Now, we, we, we don't gather a whole lot here except for this, which is what I want to focus on. Be strong and very courageous. In other words, if you know who you really are and what I've given to you, then you stand firm in your truth. This is who you are. This is your truth. When we are in our truth, we are walking in our salvation. When we are walking in our truth, when we know our truth, we are free. Another aspect of salvation. When we know who we are, we are then able to totally and completely live in accordance to the guidelines, not the law of Moses, but the guidelines as to how the Father created us to rule, reign, and to have dominion here on earth. Now, how does this shadow Christ? Well, thank you for asking. Jesus comes on the scene. He totally disregards a large portion of the rules and regulations that they felt they needed. And he begins to reveal to them true salvation by living from within the knowledge of your sonship with our father. 
and he begins to tell them the truth about who our Father really is. He begins to bring them into a new place of living, being promised land, whatever you want to say, just like Joshua did. He takes a group of people who are familiar with the way, but he, he brings them into it with a totally different approach, much like Jesus. Jesus was familiar with the ways of old. He grew up in a Jewish home with the law. He grew up around this environment, but he took a very different path. He revealed it was not about law, it was about love. It was not about religion, it was about relationship. It was not about the do's and don'ts, it was about being who we really are, i.e. salvation. And salvation comes to all of humanity because we know our truth about who we really are and what we're really capable of. And as we understand this truth, i.e. salvation, we're now living in the promised land of all of the creative ability we have and all of the things the Father put inside of us to be able to do and to function. You are not a victim to sickness. You are not a victim to disease. You are not a victim of poverty. You're not a victim of lack. You're not a victim of sadness, loneliness, depression, any emotional thing that brings you down. This is not who you are, nor you're a victim to these things. You're not a victim to some enemy, some devil, some whatever. You're not a victim to anything. You're not a pawn in the game of life, just being tossed to and fro with no ability, no power, no authority, no dominion. That is not who you are. That's largely who we've been taught we are through religious mentalities, but that's not who we really are. And we've been taught to believe that you've got to do something to be able to be able to overcome and conquer all these things. But yet Jesus was showing us who we really are and the land of promise is right in front of us. And all we have to do is come to an awareness within ourselves, become consciously aware of our truth of who we really are, know who we are, who our father made us, how he created us and how to live in that freedom. And this is what we see in Joshua. He understood, like I mentioned earlier, who he really was, what he was really capable of. He recognized it. While all of the others, except for him and Caleb, were crying and doubting and not understanding what they were able to do, Joshua had a different spirit in him or understanding or mindset. He believed differently. Jesus believed differently. You should believe differently. Not what the system tells you. Not what your eyes tell you. Not what your ears tell you. You should believe differently, living from your spirit of truth within you. You know, the spirit of truth that's telling you how loved you are. The spirit of truth that's telling you how good you are. The spirit of truth that's telling you who you really are and what you're really capable of. You know, the spirit of truth that we often ignore. We often don't pay attention to. We often don't give heed to the spirit of truth within us. And this, my dear friends, my dear students, is how we can see salvation in the Old Testament from the story of Moses, I'm sorry, of Abraham to Joshua. A group of people start to develop a mindset and an ideology about themselves. They begin to build an ideology and a mindset and an understanding about God. God, however, has, was always trying to get them to see him as father, not God. God never demanded anything from them. You look back on it and you reread it, you go through it, you keep hearing the law of Moses, the law of Moses, the law of Moses, the law of Moses. Even it says here, the, the words and the laws that Moses commanded. It was never an indication from our father. Father wanted relationship, not religion, not rules. And Joshua understood this very early on. He understood that if this is what God was saying about him and them, then let's just be it. Is that not the same thing that Jesus was showing us? If the Father says you're loved unconditionally, then just be loved unconditionally. 
If the Father says you're good, then you're good. If the Father says you're his, you're his child, then so be it. When Jesus is asked the question, Jesus teaches how to pray. Jesus says, our Father, which are in heaven. To the first century Jewish person, they understood heaven to be within them. This is why Jesus would often point to them and say, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is within you. He, they understood this. They understood what this meant. So what Jesus was literally saying was, your father inside of you, thy kingdom come, thy will be done from the inside of you. That's what, that's what they understood. But more importantly, he was bringing them to the awareness of father. And time and time again, he would say, your father, your father, our father, your father, our father, my father. Trying to bring them from an understanding of what they believed God was into relationship with father. We're not saved from an angry God. We are, we are accepted by a loving father. And this is the difference between, this is the shadow we see in the Old Testament. This is what they start to understand with Joshua. God's not an angry God looking to beat us down. He's a loving father. And they start to see a little glimpse of this. But like humanity normally does, is we tend to fall back to our old way of thinking. And the story of Israel continues from that moment and takes a dramatic pathway into a deepening of their misunderstanding of the Father. And that's when Jesus reveals Father to them, a group of people who had lost their way a long, long time ago in their understanding of Father. So that is my, that is my input, my under, my, the way I decided to teach this class about redemption in the Old Testament, looking at a group of people that mirror us, you and I, we came into this thing probably with a strong understanding of God, God doesn't play, God doesn't like angry, angry. God doesn't like ugly, God will get you, God will throw you in hell, God will, 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 God will. You know, we came, we, we probably came into it that way with fear and trembling. Oh, I better, I better do something because God might get me. And that's not father. Now, hopefully you, like I, like we are, we're starting to understand father. And the more we see father, the less we seek this God we were taught about. And we're starting to understand father. And that, my dear students, is what salvation is all about. Understanding father, not God. Okay. All right, well, that's it. I'm going to send you this, and um, you'll get ready for your, you can do your final. So I cut the class a little short today, so you're going to have time to jump into your final. All right? Have a great time, class, and thank you for spending the time with us, and hopefully I'll see you in another class.